you will have heard me talk on this project uh, previously, but I hope today uh, to take you through, <coughs> in many ways, uh, the most up-to-date um, information about our fantastic information here on Falkland Estate. Uh, as Joe says, they have a hill fort here. It is a particularly large hill fort for Fife. So my talk today is really going to introduce, to some extent, what we know about this site um, and how we have come to start to investigate it um, over the last three years. Um, so the initial part of my talk is really going to take you through uh, some of the finds on the hill over the years and to ways in which people have recorded the site um, <coughs> over the last, well, 70 years or so more. Um, I'm then going to reflect on uh, how we can classify it within the wider models of Iron Age, late Iron Age and early medieval hill forts in Scotland, <coughs> but particularly in Fife, because here we are in Fife, and uh, hopefully to set the scene for some of our other speakers who are going to be referring to the works of the, the Atlas project, um, uh, particularly Strat's talk uh, to look at how we classify sites. In particular, I am quite interested in whether or not East Lomond is a nuclear fort or not, and I will come to the significance of that in a moment. And then the mainstay of my talk is going to go through the findings. So we've had two quite small but highly significant, I hope you agree, excavations on the, the, the fort, um, and we've found quite a lot over the last few years. And then I'll reflect on some of the implications for the rest of the day. Uh, but this uh, image has been looming behind me whilst I'm giving you my very brief introduction. This is uh, what's uh, known locally, at least as the Bull Stone. Um, it was found on East Lomond Hill uh, in 1920, although if we refer to the Royal Commission's volume from 1933, it does say in 1905, there seems to be a bit of confusion over that. But if we look in the Society of Antiquaries Proceedings, you will find a paper, a very short one, by J.M. Corey, who was one of the surveyors and antiquaries, uh, archaeologists very much so, involved in surveying the site. And he refers to the fact uh, that he went to the pub in Falkland, uh, in the Bruce Arms, um, in 1925, and met the then owner of the pub, Mr. William Studley. And he bought this out from under the counter and <laughs> said, look what I found, essentially, uh, in the description. And he's described to have found it within the southern precincts of the fort and put it in his shooting bag and took it home. Um, that's an aside and a nice story, and somebody may know locally, but it is a very significant find. It's Pictish symbol stone, probably the 5th, 6th century. It's most comparable to those from Burghead, one of the, the great uh, royal forts um, of Pictland. Oh, look, to be moving forward here. There we go. I'll use that. Uh, so here is a, an aerial photograph of the site, which shows you some of the outlines of the main ramparts. There are um, probably five of these large concentric uh, enclosures with a, a large oblong series on the top and a large mound or cairn in the top right hand corner. And then a huge rampart around the base which can be viewed here. Um, this is a probably a large earthen timber construction um, with stonework presumably and it has a large ditch in the exterior. It's been known about since the 17th century. Sybil refers to the site in the early uh, 18th <coughs> century and describes a great entrenchment around the hill. And then the Society, uh, the Statistical Accounts of Scotland, rather, in the late 18th century, again referred to this site, but drawing on the work of the antiquary um, Captain Miller, who believed this was the site of Mons Grampius, the great battle of the Romans. Um, but whether or not uh, you accept that, which I don't think many of us do, it's certainly clear that the site and its environs were significant during the Pictish period. These are two Pictish symbol stones which were found on the estate here at the base of the hill um, and were pulled out of a wall. They suggest we've got a landscape of great significance here, um, an elite landscape no doubt. Um, and this is the, once we come into the modern era, this is the, the main survey that we have of the site. This is from 1933 publication done in the 20s. 
And as you can see, they've outlined these core ramparts that I referred to. But they have also referenced some discoveries that were made by the surveyors at the time, including some bloomery remains, which is slag. Um, and there were also uh, two glass black beads found at the time, and some pottery shared, which is now lost, sadly. Um, but one of the things that I started to do when I first came to this site in 2014 when I was directing a archaeology program for Landscape Partnership, Living Lomans. I was charged with investigating some of the key sites in the area, and this is one of them, um, which I quickly identified as one of the, the core important uh, archaeological monuments in this region. And so I started to look at the site, and as an early medievalist, I started to wonder, well, is this just the extent of the site? And as a landscape archaeologist, so when you look at the aerial photographs, you can see the main ramparts, but there are other things going on in this hill. Do you see those two outlines of earthworks on the far side there? Well, I was particularly interested in the environs of the site. It was a conservation project. So we worked with Historic Scotland to try and understand the environs of the monument a bit more, because it's a scheduled monument. So this is a LIDAR image, an aerial uh, laser scan, essentially. And one of the things that was immediately picked up is that we do have indications of other earthworks. Now, these two earthworks come through here. It is very slight, but there is the outline of what appears to be an outer enclosure um, in association with the fort um, on the southern shoulder of the hill. Now, it is very scant, and it seems likely that the side of the hill has been improved. But this led me to start to wonder about whether or not we have what was termed by Stevenson in 1949 as a, a nuclear fort, or an Iron Age fort that has been redeveloped um, into the late Iron Age and Pictish period. And Stevenson's model was, uh, is very old now, and it's been very influential. Um, but his model was really based around a very few number of sites, and one of them is, is Dalmahoy, just outside uh, Edinburgh, and this is the general description of of nuclear forts. You have a core um, fortification in the middle and a series of uh, interrelated uh, hierarchies of enclosures. And, and here certainly the golden studded piece suggested and mould suggested early medieval activity. And here's another one that he referred to, Rubens Law um, in the borders. Again, uh, it's an area of Roman activity uh, in, in this part of Scotland. Um, and there are associated remains in the surrounding landscape. But his view was that there was a strong early medieval aspect to this model of interrelated enclosures. And this, as I say, has been very influential. So uh, the great Leslie Alcock, who was uh, one of my professors at Glasgow, um, set about trying to investigate more of these sites based on historical information in the 1970s, so looking for annals references. And indeed, when we look further afield, one of the sites that Stevenson referenced, uh, Dundurn in Perthshire, uh, also appears to conform to this model. Um, but one of the things that's quite interesting about them is that they're all the main ones that have been excavated, uh, Dunad, Dundurn, as I referenced, um, and more recently, King's Seat, they're quite small, <coughs> the diminutive monuments in comparison to the great massive hill forts that we also have, multi-valley hill forts in Scotland. So, Here's a great comparative model, which was just published in 2016 by Noble, who again references this idea of the nuclear fort as a site of elite power with a series of interrelated controlled spaces. But one of the things that's very striking about this model is that we only really have a very few number of excavated examples. Um, to, to prove it. And also, when you start to take the time to look at the various types of plans, um, you start to see great regional variation. Um, and also, there is a growing sense that you know, a model has been trying to fit in to quite complex monuments with complex histories and, and a great diversity of regional activity. And that's one of the things that I'm quite interested in. Um, and how East Lomond and the forts and Fife fit into that, I think is quite interesting because of the nature of Fife itself as, a, in many ways, a border zone between the north and southern parts of Scotland. 
So here's another example on the west coast of Scotland, where many of the sites are, are much smaller. Um, Donegoyle, um, which has early historic um, remains from it. And more closer to home, we find Perthshire, two other examples cited, one with an early medieval annals reference. And here, these have just started to be excavated uh, by David Strachan and AOC in Perthshire. But even this one, which could be seen as an archetypal nuclear hill fort, early medieval fort, has given no early medieval evidence whatsoever so far. And most of the dates coming out of there are from the 3rd and 4th century BC. Whereas at King's Seat, another nuclear fort, we're getting mostly early medieval evidence for a site associated with the Iron Age tribe of the Caledoni by its name. <coughs> so there's a great deal of complexity when we're dealing with forts. Um, and it's particularly when we come to Fife, and I'm sure Strat will, will go into more detail on the diversity of sites, but we, we have around 50 uh, hill forts that have been identified by the fantastic project as Joe's referred to. It's just been completed. It's a great resource um, to use as well. And here they are, and um, a great deal of diversity. Some of them, on the face of it, quite similar to East Lowland. Norman's Law on the, above the Tay, um, which uh, is, is the Dunmore by some names, the Great Fort. Large outer enclosure, central uh, fortification, um, but lots of other archaeology which suggests Iron Age activity. So we have a uh, hut circle. Uh, complexes in the interior, not excavated this site. Although one site, probably the most extensively excavated hill fort, uh, if not in Scotland, uh, certainly in this part of the world, is Clatcher Craig. Of course, they've dynamited out of existence above Newborough. But before it was, Ritchie and Close Brooks uh, managed to excavate an extensive series of trenches. And here, um, a, another site often cited as a, as a nuclear fort there was extensive evidence uh, for early medieval activity there. So there was metal working remains here. There is a silver ingot mould from the site. Um, and sediment within the great interior uh, enclosure at the top. And radiocarbon dates suggesting rebuilding of the ramparts. But it's important to stress that there's also Iron Age activity, earlier Iron Age activity, and Roman activity. So... When I say Roman activity, Roman pottery, so from the 1st, 2nd century. So there is a diversity um, of activity on these sites. Other sites more locally, Dumb Glow over in Carossa, a multi-valley site, quite distinctive. And superficially similar, uh, just uh, near Glen Devon, is, is this site, the Downhill, um, again with this multi-valley aspect to it. Um, we also have in Fife, Iron Age uh, monumental sculpture, um, architecture in the form of this Brock at Drum Carroll um, in East Fife. So lots of diversity, including, as we'll hear later, uh, promontory forts as well here on the east uh, coast of, of Fife at Randerston. So these are promontory forts set along large cliffs and very diminutive sites as well. So here again, another site on the estate Maiden Castle, just in the uh, western uh, lee of East Lomond, is Maiden Castle, an unexcavated site, presumed to be Iron Age. Um, not unheard of to have two Iron Age um, and later Iron Age sites next to each other as well. But nothing really on a par with uh, the kind of sites that we see in the borders and in other areas in the Friesen Galley, such as Traprain Law, which, you know, it could be viewed as an oppidum, a great, uh, great enclosure upon a summit with an extensive settlement. In this case, you know, um, one of the, the best examples of late Roman uh, settlement in a hill fort in Scotland and still stands up as something of an anomaly uh, for those reasons. So that's a very, very quick run through of the context for East Lomond. Um, and this is really where I was in 2014 with these themes in mind. So we began a series of work outside the Schedule Monument, including geophysics, which are the blue areas here. And these identified the line of the enclosure here, and also returns of enclosures on this side. And I targeted trenches based on those findings. And this was the trench C on the uh, east side of the site, where we find uh, a ditch at the base of this trench, and what appeared to be a collapsed 
stone uh, revetment or rampart. And we've got a two series of radiocarbon dates, one from the 1st century to 2nd century, and another third to 4th century. On the other side of the site, it appears to be a different separate enclosure, this stone lined bank with burnt material in the core, um, not def definitely timber latticed, but certainly a, a burnt base to it, and highly damaged, of course, as you can see, it's in the area of the improvements on the hill. And this burnt deposit underneath here, which is um, during excavation, and a radiocarbon date from the 5th, 6th century um, from that enclosure. And this led to us very quickly to uh, reimagining the site for an interpretive panel, which you can still see up on the hill today. And we also excavated in the interior of these enclosures, and what could be termed, I would thought, as an annex. So this is an the outer enclosures that I've been referring to. And this is a 10 metre area that we opened up in 2014. And we uncovered immediately, it became apparent that we had a dense archaeological resource. Lots of settlement activity, uh, as we'll see, and metalworking activity as well, of multiple periods. And we didn't have the resources at that time, so we stopped, essentially. But this is some of the finds that we've got. So crucible fragments for... Uh, smelting <coughs> metal, uh, whetstones, spindle worms for production of uh, uh, textiles, uh, quernstones, all the kind of domestic activity in the late Iron Age, including jewellery, and this very rare Iron Age um, horse harness bit from uh, an early historic level. So it was a fantastic piece of work, and that is really one of the reasons why we wanted to come back, is to give the estate definition to the nature of the remains that we uncovered, and to explore options to, to build further investigation of this outer area, which none of which is scheduled. Um, and this is the uh, wider view of the uh, trenches that we opened up. So this is very much a kind of post-excavation view um, nearing the end of the dig. And as you can see, we uncovered a, a great diversity of remains. And what I'm going to do now is basically take you through my understanding, as we currently uh, are, of the phasing of this archaeology. Now, we're still awaiting our new radiocarbon dates, so most of what I'm going to tell you is based on the radiocarbon dates that we had from 2014, and also the stratigraphic relationships between the archaeology. So, I'm going to kind of take us back through from the latest activity on the site. So this is where we were in 2014. We had uncovered this large stone st structure at the base here, and we had had to uh, box section it, essentially, to try and understand what we had within the resources we had. We had box setting over here, another possible wall, and a whole series of other stone features in the interior, apparently structural, and pits features as well. So one of the things we have charged with understanding is what is this, essentially? So we targeted an additional trench, which was the main focus for our training of schools in the trench, although it was a very important one to see whether this was something structural to do with domestic activity or something else. Um, so I've drawn out the evidence, and we're currently finishing the report on this. And this is what I would term as the post-Roman or early medieval activity, uh, again, based on finds and stratigraphy. So the latest activity on the site are these pits and this feature here, this curved feature. And as I say here, I believe that this is a, a paved roadway um, and associated with these other aspects of the site. So we have this box setting and a hearth here, and I'm going to just take you through some of those. So this was um, one of the key finds that we had from 2014, this box setting, and it was half sectioned and revealed these different coloured sandstone uh, paving at the base of it. It had not much in its fill, and when it was revealed this year, uh, one of the stones has collapsed on the side there, it had this rather crude paving in the base of it, and the paving was uh, lined with clay. None of which had been particularly heat affected, apart from some redeposited burnt material that worked its way between the stones, slightly over cut on one side. And this has led us to posit that this is perhaps not a hearth, but may have actually been holding water, uh, potentially. And we're still looking at comparatives for this, and I'm currently talking with 
uh, Gemma Cruikshank at the National Museum, who's a PhD on ferrous uh, metalworking, looking for some other examples of a feature like this. But I think its context allows us to interpret it more. So this pit feature uh, below here being excavated by one of our volunteers, Bob, was particularly interesting. We knew it was there in previous years. It had a, a large fragment of iron slag in the top of it, and the rest of it was filled with burnt material and other slag debris as well. Um, our radiocarbon date from the top. This pit gave us a, a sixth, seventh century date and pretty much sealed the rest of this part of the site because this pit had truncated uh, part of this pathway stone structure here which has been partially removed there to allow the investigation in this area. And one of the things the estate wanted us to do is try and prove what metal activity was going on here. So we did a hammer scale survey and actually managed to map a density of hammer scale activity in this zone with its greatest density in this corner. So there may well have been an active workshop uh, beyond my arm there. Other evidence of metal working, I think, is this uh, fragment of a structure here. Now, or initially, I thought, is this a furnace? Uh, it, having looked into this more, it's not got a great deal of structure to it. Um, and Fraser and I have discussed this in previous occasion. It may well be the base of a hearth which has been robbed out. The whole subsoil around this feature was heavily baked. Um, so all the lower stratigraphy has been affected by the activity and association with it. We also got two moulds from the dig this year. This is uh, uh, what we think is an ingot mould. It is damaged. Its XRF analysis to tell us what might have been in it has drawn a blank. The one possibility is it may not have actually been used in anger, or the soil within the interior may hold the answer yet. Uh, but either way, it is the second from this site. It was one of the other finds of our friend Mr. Corey uh, from the 1920s. And this is the other um, mould at the top here, which could be the mould of uh, a pin. Other metalworking activity includes these uh, burnt pieces of ceramic with slag on the exterior. Um, this one may be diagnostic. It has this grooved feature here, tent burning on the outside. It, it's been suggested by you and Campbell that they, from Glasgow University that this could be a bung, uh, perhaps for sealing around uh, a bellows. And we've also found iron ore from the site. This large fragment was placed on top of uh, some of the earlier activity um, on the site, which may be prehistoric, um, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, and this piece was also found in the debris across the area of metalworking I've been referred to. So we literally have bags of the stuff um, from this site, some of which may be non-ferrous, uh, some of which certainly is fair, so we're hoping to have this examined uh, more. But from quite a small dig, uh, it, it's a reasonable size quantities. Um, we've also got lots of fragments, um, or again a small dig, of crucibles, um, some of which are extremely fine as well, um, as you can see, and have metal uh, work still adhering to them. So we, we want to have those examined. Um, so we, we clearly have uh, metal working on the site, with smithing certainly, and apparently smelting as well, from multiple periods. So we have the latter part of this uh, 7th century activity, and then in earlier phases we're also seeing this. At the end of our uh, paved surface here, we also got this, which appears to be a quernstone. Um, this is a reworked quernstone. Lots of debate among the team whether it's got carving on it on one side. Certainly has a socket uh, fragment down here. And it's comparable to other schist querns um, from nearby in Perthshire. But what's clear is that schist and mica schist is not <coughs> local to this area. So the object has been bought onto site and perhaps placed on purpose. So I'm going to take us through uh, this paving area as well. As I said, there was some debate. Initially, I thought perhaps this is a wall. It's always troubling me there's no real rubble in association with it, and also that it's very finely laid and has structure to it. So as well as this fine paving, there's also quite clearly laid um, pebbling on it, patches of metalling across it as well. Um, so we explored this further, and it, it did indeed extend beyond 15 metres through the landscape of this curve. It's been uh, sectioned there. Um, 
And we traced it um, into the landscape, as I say. Here's an example of what we found. Now, there is some debate around the site that was had on site, uh, but there are comparators for similar features on hill forts, the best of which I've tracked down so far is from uh, Yeoman and Driscoll's excavations at Edinburgh Castle. Now, they couldn't ever really finally date this feature, but they said it was no later than 1000, and certainly overlay some of the Iron Age settlement remains. And it, it's very similar to the feature we have. It's also not unheard of to find paved road surfaces in early historic mon mon monasteries of the time as well. So it, it's not impossible that we'd have a, a paving um, and roadway on a hill fort at this time. And I think we've got one here at East Lomond. We got some radiocarbon information dating. Uh, the area behind Joy there, we had our uh, fifth and uh, sixth century uh, radiocarbon date. And from the associated soils on the other side came metalworking. So we got this rather fine um, iron spearhead um, as well from that level. And uh, a series of these as well, cones, which we believe are spear uh, butts. So we've got uh, militaria, martial activity. And we also got a very important pottery find um, from this level. This is a share of e-ware. Uh, it's the, only the fourth from the eastern side of Scotland. Um, and Ewan Campbell, who has basically spent his life studying these things, was very excited when we showed him this. Um, and it's probably, though, not being traded from the uh, west of France, where these things come from in the 6th and 7th century. It's probably given as a diplomatic gift. Because the, the tended model of uh, mechanism for trading these objects comes along the west coast. They generally held things like dyes, um, olive oil, and the like. They're high prestige goods. And its discovery at East Lomond, um, as has been discovered at Clatchet Craig as well, is very significant. It sets the site's status on a royal level, I would argue. Um, we can debate that, of course. Um, so now I'm going to quickly take us to the, the northern side of the site. Now, there is earlier remains across the area that I've been telling you about beyond, but this is where we got some of our best preserved settlement activity. And here's the, the current plan relating to that. So as you can see, there's a hearth at the top. This wall line has occupation material from this level butting against it. And we got the remains of floor levels um, in an arc around where we can see these post settings. And it looks like we may have some kind of oblong or rectilinear structure at the top of our site, although we've only sampled part of it. Now, this is really quite rare to get archaeology of this level of preservation in a Scottish hill fort in an upland site. Um, and it, not just to have a settlement remains that well preserved, but to have the kind of continuity of settlement was very unusual and we were very pleased to have Ian Ralston visit us on the site and he, he was he didn't say a great deal at first but on pushing him he said this is very good archaeology this is this is great stuff um, so we're, we're quite proud of our discovery here so I'm just going to take you through some of it. as you can see there's the hearth at the top and there are a series of earlier hearths underneath it and we think we have at least five phases of this hearth. And this building seems to have been redeveloped over uh, the generations. And this is the structural nature of it. It appears to be mostly wood. Um, so we have these post settings, which are actually kind of scooped and placed in the lower occupation deposits. Um, and we're getting evidence of the kinds of things that people have and jewelry in these places. So this is a shale armlet, which is unfinished. And we also had evidence for the production on site in this waster. And we got this very fine 4th century corded uh, possible jet um, piece. And it's very similar to examples from Yorkshire um, in, in uh, northern England uh, from a burial context. And so we can be pretty firm about the dating of that. And with that, we got pottery as well. This is late Roman pottery, and very thankful for Fraser for helping us with this material. At least two vessels of drinking vessels from the site. Um, we think this is probably a diplomatic gift to the area, and it appears to be ox 
uh, for Shire ware, and similar to coated wares from the Nene Valley as well, which copied earlier models. So it's, it's a very significant find to, to locate these at the site. And it ties in with a, a growing sense of evidence Shaw Fraser is going to talk on, in that this area seems to have had, some extent, for some periods, a friendly relationship with Rome. And it ties into metal detecting it from around the hill as well. This 4th century coin has also come from the site. And we've got this uh, other very fine piece of metal working, this ring-headed pin. It's a rosette-headed pin. And this again is 3rd, 4th century came from the floor level of this house um, and it's quite an unusual and rare find as well. We do have a lot of ring-headed pins from the world, uh, this part of the world, but the rosette-headed pin has a very thin distribution, mainly found at Chapin Law and one from Cove C and a few outliers beyond. This is a native late Iron Age development with relationships with Ir Irish models of ring-headed pin beforehand. Other metalworking as well includes copper alloy and iron pieces which have been decorated or at least been worked perhaps on wood or leather um, and then we come to the earlier period so we've gone through uh, beneath that and we've got these series of other hearths below it um, which seem to go back to the first second century so this is a type one um, glass armlet um, and beyond that, under our pathway and our metalworking, the 4th century levels, we found two other hearths, which had more Iron Age activity, including this stone ball and glass bead. We had this 1st, 2nd century Type 2 glass armlet, which, as you can see, is found mostly in northern um, England and southern Scotland. And we also had this fragment of Roman glass, which is possibly from... A vessel similar to this. So we've got sense of continuity here which is rather unexpected including this uh, Roman melon bead again first second century and so we, we're really looking at a density of occupation here and a continuity of occupation here on the southern side of the hill. All of these hearths in association with it it's kind of reminiscent more of what we're seeing perhaps at Trapeen Law, also at uh, Edinburgh Castle, than some of our northern and western examples. But beyond this, we got a final surprise on the dig, and I'm just coming to the end here, was this large stone structure which caused a lot of head scratching in our western trench and was unexpected even on the geophysics. It appeared to have this stone setting um, in the midst of it, which once exposed looked very kist-like. And indeed, on the top of it, there were two unearned possible cremation burials associated with it. And these have been looked at in National Museums with one of our volunteers, and it's turned up this bone toggle. So we may actually have a Bronze Age uh, burial monument immediately next to our ironworking and settlement site. And it ties in with some background evidence for uh, prehistoric pottery and also flints that we have from the site. So there's a great deal of continuity which is coming through. Um, we clearly have a Roman Iron Age period site going all the way up to the 7th century, a large annex activities and workshops, I would argue a potentate settlement, certainly uh, Roman material coming to the site, we have prehistoric and reuse of the site potentially, um, and I think it really reminds us that we, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface of many of these sites, that there's a great deal of regional variation and that our excavations and surveys really need to try and look at the nuances of these sites and how they fit into wider regional models. And so I'll come to a close there. I'm really looking forward to seeing the wider context in Britain and in Fife. And really, one of the things that's important about today is that the estate is looking to develop more work here at the site. So we're looking for your ideas. We're certainly looking for our key speakers' inputs and, uh, well, let's have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.